Smith. Good morning to the last Count Corley. Just a comment, and it struck me very much. I went out to uh, show my solidarity to the protesters outside, but I came from where my office is in Ike House down to the Doyle. Yeah. And it's, you'd swear to God there was a, a, a revolution happening outside the gates. There's barricades that must have cost a fortune from right across the laneway that leads to the back of Dawson Street and over the other side of Kidlare Street. And then there's big uh, metal barriers outside Buswell's Hotel and it's impossible for somebody to move in and out of it. Only that I'm a deputy that the Gardaí recognised I wouldn't have been able to move. Why is there such paranoia about this subject and women? Why is society so terrified to allow women have a voice on an issue that has everything to do with their body? And the vast majority of people out there are ordinary young women. They were not going to storm the gates of Leinster House and come in with submachine guns and mow us all down. They're out there to plead with us. For God's sake, get on with it. This Doyle has a shameful history of dealing with this issue. I have seen it with my own eyes long before I came in here. I could Obviously, it used to crease me to see for 21 years after the Supreme Court ruled on the X case, for 21 solid years, there was paradise played out in this house. No party had the guts to move on this issue until Claire Daly brought in the first bill, in, I think it was in April 2012. The first time anybody had the guts to say, this is an issue and we have to confront it. Now, I'm acutely aware because I was a campaigner uh, in, in, in 84 for the Eighth Amendment, I'm acutely aware of Joanne Hayes, of the Kerry babies and all of the stats. I'm also acutely aware how young people, anybody under the age of 45, not just your daughter, uh, Mary Lou, but anybody under the age of 40, 45, is horrified today, having read the details of what happened to, uh, to, uh, Anne Love, or to, sorry, to Joanne Hayes all those years ago. But we're not just talking about the darkness of the 80s. Hello. In 2017, a young woman was sectioned because she said she was suicidal and wanted to have an abortion. She was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. In 2014, we kept a clinically dead woman alive for several weeks against the wishes of her family because the uh, fetus inside her had a heartbeat. In 2014, a raped asylum seeker was forced against her will to continue with a pregnancy. In 2012, Savita, Savita Halapanabar died having requested an abortion in the hospital with Galway. And then we have the alphabet soup of Miss X, Miss C, Miss D. You go on and on. And we have the condemnation by the UN Human Rights Commission that what happened to Amanda Mellet was inhumane, degrading and cruel. What does that say about this country and the political representatives who have run this country for the last decades? It says a lot. And we are indeed living in the dark ages. We don't have to think about the Kerry babies and I want to say to people out there, I know there are genuine people out there who do not want to see this happen again, who are ashamed of that shameful dark history but they're worried when they hear, oh the floodgates will open and women will want to have abortions every other day of the week because it's, it's a great way not to get pregnant or to get pregnant just get rid of it, just get the pill, swallow it and end the story. I really want to say to people out there, if you do not want to see any of these incidents repeated, if you want to take obstetricians and gynaecologists who came to the committee and gave evidence that the Eighth Amendment creates a chill factor for the medical profession when it comes to dealing with, with women, they are afraid of their lives to intervene when there's a heartbeat because of that Eighth Amendment. To those who are even middle of the road, please vote to get rid of it. Because until you do, we are going to have a repetitions of XYZs, Amanda Mellets and others. And I think that has to really go across clearly. The vast, vast majority of people in this country do not wish to see that sort of a society. Even though I think there is an extreme atmosphere around this issue, and particularly in the corridors of religion and sometimes in the corridors of power. And to those who want to stop women having bodily autonomy, I'd like to say this to them. Minister, you, you made a very good speech, actually. I read it. It's very good. It's very conciliatory. But there's some gaping holes in it because you referred to the 1861 Act, which gave women, uh, put, subjected them to a sentence of penal life, penal servitude for life. Life, I think, is about seven years. We actually have an act now that subjects women to 14 years, but you forgot to mention it. You also said you want to give out as much information as possible in the course of this referendum. Can we please ensure all deputies a sense of responsibility if you give out information Please make sure it's accurate, so that when we are told by a deputy in Fianna Fáil that there will be a floodgates opening 
because uh, to, for, for abortions, for um, um, Down syndrome, please give accurate information. You cannot get a test for Down syndrome prior to 12 weeks without paying out 400 euro. And actually, the uh, case that, that the, the subject that uh, Ruth raised about socio-economic really comes down to this. You could always have an abortion in this country if you could afford it. You could always have an abortion. You can get on a plane. You can go away and pay for it. When you're poor, when you're an asylum seeker, when you live in direct provision, or when you're a worker who cannot take the time off and who has to scrape the pennies together to pay up to two grand for an abortion, that is when uh, you're actually absolutely discriminated against. And that's one good reason to remove it, to remove that discrimination on class basis and that discrimination against a co cohort of women who don't have the right to enter and leave this country freely. I think we also have to have respect for doctors in the medical profession and give them the space to work with women to make the decisions about their health. And sometimes women are even subjected because it is the only time in maternity care that you as an individual do not have a right over your own body to say what happens. Very often women, and I know many of them, who are uh, going through miscarriages are forced to wait for 20, maybe 25 hours because the doctor is not allowed to induce them and they have to wait in terrible pain until uh, the miscarriage actually is, is, is seen to the end and has left many women my age I know of distressed for their whole lives and has had an impact on all of, uh, and all of, on all of their families. The last thing I'd like to make a very strong appeal to is to those who think that by protecting the Eighth Amendment they are protecting something precious. Actually you're not. All you're protecting is the dark, dark history of this country. You are not going to protect any unborn um, fetus, any unborn potential child by protecting the Eighth Amendment because you cannot force somebody to be pregnant when they don't want to be pregnant. They will find a way out of it and it's either, as has already been said, support legal abortion or support illegal abortion or support the extradition and the enforced exile of women out of this country to Liverpool, to London, to Holland uh, and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, or indeed force young women in particular to have to have an abortion on their own, in their own bed, uh, by taking the pill without any medical supervision because of the chill factor of the 14 year sentence. They're even afraid to tell their own parents. And we've had a situation in Northern Ireland where there's been three women charged and arrested uh, for using or, or procuring the abortion pill. One was a mother who procured it for her child and the other two were women who procured it for themselves. That also has to change and I would hope that if we get the Eighth Amendment out of the Constitution and begin to establish uh, legal safe abortion for women in this country that it will cross the border and that the Brexit factor will not stop it crossing the border because actually they should have had it long before us under the 1968 uh, Abortion Act in Britain. I want to say to those who think that they're protecting precious life to think about it uh, in this way. There are children living in this country who have been born in this country. One fifth of them live in poverty. Uh, something like 3,000 of them are in homeless accommodation tonight. Molly during the week was an example of one of the hundreds of children who haven't had their rights met and they are born. They are human flesh and they are living. We haven't endorsed the, U the uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Pe People with Disabilities. We're continuing to force uh, children into homeless accommodation. If you feel so passionate about life, please, please join us in fighting to change that to get the rights of people with disability acknowledged, to end homelessness and to end poverty among uh, lone parents, which is at its highest rate ever. There are many ways to skin a cat, there are many ways to protect human life. And that is what I would like to say to those who think that I'm some kind of a terrorist, and I'm sure many of you have received the literature calling us terrorists for supporting a woman's right to choose. And the right to choose, by the way, is to be able to choose to have a child as well. And how can you choose to have a child with dignity and respect if you have no access to a home, if you have no access to a proper health service, if you have no access to a job, if you have no access to free IV treatment when you're finding it difficult to get pregnant. So choice works both ways. To choose to be able to control pregnancies, to choose to be able to have a child. That's the sort of future society I think we want to live in.